I'll I'll do my bit first, and then Laura will do hers. And the way I have approached the update is to try. There's a there's a mass of cases. One of the problems with any sort of update talk is that so many cases now are put on Bailey and appear in specialist reports like BPIR, where the cases are just decided on their own facts. There's no principle of law that comes out of them. The first instance, they're almost incapable of being cited sensibly in any other case. I say sensibly, you can cite cases which are all on their own facts, but it only annoys judges because they say, well, this is just an illustration of a very well-established point, isn't it? Why do I need to look at how it's been applied on the particular facts of another case? So it, it, what I've tried to do is identify an area or areas which I think are of general relevance or interest to those engaged in personal insolvency, although something of what I say has a, an echo uh, with the corporate talk from this morning. Um, and then I'll hand over to, to Laura and we can take some questions at the end. The area I really wanted to look at more than anything, and I'm having to deal, I'm having to do this with one screen, so you must bear with me. I wanted to start with petitions and the recent amendment um, to uh, what is section 265, which provides the jurisdictional basis for creditors' petitions in this jurisdiction. And you see there, I've set out verbatim uh, section 2651. Well, I've set it out verbatim, save that, the letters, the words in square brackets in B are no longer part of the provision. Um, as of um, the end of the transition period with Brexit on the 31st of December 2020, I just want to explain before I move on to this and look at a couple of the cases on it. I just want to explain something about how the insolvency regime, and you can take for what I say about bankruptcy to have equal application on the equivalent provisions dealing with winding up petitions, how that has evolved after Brexit or in the course of Brexit and subsequently. The, and and I'll, I'll have to keep this simple because it's, it's mind-bogglingly technical when you look at the amount of legislation involved, but it's like a lot of things, if, if you work on it, you can actually cut it down to something reasonably comprehensible. We left the EU uh, by reason or by way of the European Withdrawal Act 2018. And that took effect on the 26th of June 2018. And it provided measures which were to last until the end of the transition period. Uh, then, as yet not, not defined, but it covered that period. Ultimately, the period was transition ended on the 31st of December 2020. The effect of the 2018 Act was to repeal the European Communities Act 1972, but for our purposes, more significantly, to convert into domestic law the applicable EU law, in our case on insolvency, that was applicable at that moment. So the effect, therefore, of the 2018 Act was to bring into domestic law the EU regulation on um, insolvency proceedings so as to apply as if it were a domestic provision. Now, there's subsequently then, there's an or a European Withdrawal Act 2020, which had the effect of amending the relevant, in inverted commas, EU law, as it had been brought into domestic law, going forward after exit, after the 31st of December 2020. Just in passing, if this is your thing and you, and you want full info on it, there are two sets of regulations which are worth knowing about because they give effect to what I've just said in broad terms. Those are the um, Insolvency Amendment EU Regulations 2019 and the Insolvency Amendment EU Regulations 2020. And those have the effect of amending EU law as it's retained in UK law by way of secondary legislation in terms of detail. But that, that is, this will be all detailed in the handouts, but that is the mechanism by which we've left the EU. But we're left with, because one question, I've been asked this more than once, 
um, in the last year, I've done a couple of quite big cases on, on commie, is, well, why do we keep talking about commie if we're no longer in the EU? Well, that's the answer, because the commie concept has been brought into domestic law and actually continues to be applicable. Well, how do we square that with what Section 265 says, 265 being the slide I'm looking at at the moment? Well, there are a number of grounds set out in 2651 which allow, which give primary uh, jurisdiction to a court to entertain a bankruptcy petition. And those are commie in England and Wales. And if you're thinking, what does he mean by commie? Don't worry, I'll come on to it in a minute. AB is commie is in a member state other than Denmark, and the debtor has an establishment for which read business in England and Wales, or and then you can see the words in square brackets, I won't read them out. They've gone from the end of, from 11 o'clock, 11, 2300 hours on the 31st of December, the words in square brackets went, and we're left with B, the test in subsection two is met. Now, the words, you may say, well, why have the words, you may not say, you might not be bothered, but fine. But if, if you were to ask, why have the words in square brackets gone? Because they're OTOs. With the passing of the EU regulation, applicable to this jurisdiction as a member state of the EU, the jurisdictional requirement that, that a debtor had commie in a member state of the EU, which has adopted the EU regulation, is entirely otios. All you've got to satisfy is B. The order in which those provisions appear, I think, is misleading. It's not misleading, they're clear enough. But what you should understand is, given the more exacting requirements under A and A, B, B in isolation is far more likely to be engaged than the other two, and it's easier to establish. Let's look at what, what B is, which just says the test in subsection two is met. The test is, and these are all alternatives, and I think you can probably break this down into four alternatives. So alternative one is the debtors domiciled in England and Wales. Now, if your eye casts down the page to catch the words ordinarily, ordinarily resident or has had a place of residence, you might be one of those people like me who thinks, oh, no, domicile, residence, place of residence. This is all, doesn't it all mean the same thing? No, it doesn't. For domicile, just think of permanently homed, if homed's a word, or permanently housed, or it's a place of permanent um, residence, if you like. So domicile in England and Wales, that is difficult to demonstrate. I'll, I'll explain what domicile means in a minute. Um, or at any time in the period of three years ending with the day on which the petition is presented. Now, pause there. It doesn't say you have to be for the three years preceding the petition, you've got to satisfy any of these requirements. It's just at any time in the three years prior to the petition, you've got to be able to take one of the following three boxes. So Little Roman 1, ordinarily resident in England and Wales. Little Roman 2 has had a place of residence in England and Wales. Or 3 has carried on business in England and Wales. And I'm going to explain what each of those means. But if you are within any of those criteria, A, B, A, B1 or B2, and B1 you can see splits into two parts, then you have jurisdiction to present a creditor's petition. Um, that's just putting the uh, question, um, I was probably trying to work it out myself when I wrote that slide. Um, that's just putting what I've said already in a, in a different way. Let me work back then to just start with 2651A and 2651AB. Um, if you don't meet 2651B and the limbs in that, and I'm going to come back to those, then the questions you've got to ask are, am I within A or AB? A is 2651A, is the debtors commie in England and Wales? There is a very useful summary by Mr. Justice Miles in a case um, called Mellors Group Limited, one of the cases Leslie mentioned this morning. And just so that we're all saying the same thing, um, let me just remind you um, of, let, let me come back to that, but let, let, let me just, um, what I was going to do was just um, explain 
um, what the what the commie requirements um, what the commie requirements are. He said, realizing that he'd messed up his notes. Um, so keep talking. Um, just give me a moment because I've moved that out of order. Apologies. So, um, commie requirements um, are, you, you can break them down into effectively into seven subheadings. So these, these are all principles, not factors. First principle, you need legal certainty and fore foreseeability that, are, that enable commie to be established or ascertained by available objective features, which are apparent to a typical third party. Now that's a bit of a mouthful, but what it means is, is when, you, when the court assesses commie, what it's looking at is not what the debtor himself or herself says their commie is, but what's apparent to a third party. I've had a case where this is this is loomed large. And what typically happens is, is that the, the debtor will say, well, actually, my commie is in another state. And I can evidence that by the production of large amounts of material, which would appear to give the impression that that person had some sort of connection with that jurisdiction. Gym membership, private medical insurance, bank accounts, all those sorts of things. The reason that's misconceived is, is whilst it may be a factor the court takes into consideration, and um, it is not determinative because it's not ascertainable, readily ascertainable, at least without extensive investigation. And that isn't required for the test. It's not readily ascertainable to a third party. And that's what matters when we talk about a typical third party. In, in the case of corporate debtors, this is a personal insolvency update. So I'll just mention that the registered office carries a presumption that wherever that is, is where Comi is based. Um, although, third point, a corporate debtor can move its registered office, even for self-serving purposes. Although it's clear from a case called Eurofood that the presumption that Comi is where the registered office is likely to be far easily, more easily capable of being rebutted if the registered office is in fact the letterbox office, a letterbox address, there's loads of addresses in really fine properties in London that you can get letterbox addresses paid, which you pay for for the week. They look great on paper, but nobody's there. It's just a, a mail forwarding uh, scenario. Fourth principle is the burdens on the party seeking to rebut the presumption of commie to show there's another place where the debtor conducts the administration of its interests. So that again applies to a a private individual. And what we're concerned about is the administering of those interests, not where uh, the debtor happens to operate commercially. That's the fifth factor. Sixth is you have to examine the position as it stands as of the date of the petition. And seven is commie is changeable. So it's possible to change um, commie. But the, the, the proviso to that is that commie itself carries with it the connotation of some degree, not of permanence, but some degree of uh, non-short-term movability, to use um, a, a, a phrase that isn't a term of art, but from which you'll understand what I'm saying. If it's not something to be moved around, other than with good commercial reasons, and there's really good commercial reasons for moving it very often, if it happens to move coincidentally with a petition, then the court's not going to have too much difficulty in the right sort of case in, in looking behind that. That's the, that's the commie ground in 2651A. And 1AB is as on, I'm sorry, is as on that sheet, is as I've numbered it, um, uh, whether the commie is, if, if, if commie isn't in England and Wales, is the commies, um, is the debtor's commie in, a, in a, an EU state? other than Denmark? And if so, does the commie also, does the debtor also have an establishment in England and Wales, which is the additional requirements for which read business? If so, then you're through the procedural gateway into presentation of the petition. I think 2651AB is easily the less common of all of those. So, um, 
let me go back. Let me just row back a bit to the 2651B requirements, um, the first of which is domicile. The best, uh, the two leading cases on domicile are a case called um, Rebird. Uh, it's a tax case in the Court of Appeal, and a case called Reed Brown in 1978. There is, a, there is, however, a really first-rate, um, as you'd expect, a summary of the principles in the judgment in the Court of Appeal of Lady Justice Arden in a case called Barlow, Clowes and Henwood. Now, I'm not going to take you through all of those. I said earlier on, for domicile, if you're like me and you confuse words that all sound the same, or even words that don't all sound the same, think of domicile as meaning permanent home. I'll just give you the, the headline factors or characteristics of domicile for the purposes of the first requirement of 2651A. A person is in general domiciled in the country in which he's considered, he or she's considered by English law to have his permanent, for his reader, permanent home. No person can be without a domicile. No person can have two domiciles at the same time. An existing domicile is presumed to continue until it's proved that a new domicile has taken its place and every independent person can acquire a domicile of choice by a combination of residence and intention of permanent or indefinite residence, but not otherwise. So that's the requirement for domicile. I'll give you an example of a case I mentioned in a, in a minute uh, in which domicile um, was, it was common ground that the debtor wasn't domiciled in this jurisdiction. Um, let me then move back on to 2652B. Um, what do we mean by ordinarily resident and having a place of residence? Um, the best um, analysis or synthesis of that comes in the judgment in Reynolds, Porter, Chamberlain and Khan of Chief Registrar Baster as he was. And again, what I'll, I'll do is just so you've got at least a flavor because the problem with these update talks is you talk about something that precedes the last year and people say not everybody but some people say i thought it was an update course that of course assumes everybody can remember everything about the law before it as it was one year and one day and therefore there before uh, preceding the seminar so I, I, I don't apologize for just reminding you what these things say to give them some context in in context in relation to the, the new provision we're looking at. So this is what Baster says about ordinarily, ordinarily resident. It's not to be treated as a term of art. Ordinary residence is a question of, of fact and degree. There has to be a degree of permanence. The person must intend to and actually reside for some period of time. Casual visits won't suffice. General staying at a hotel is probably not sufficient to amount to residence. Although the court did not, the court doesn't have a definite opinion on the point where a person has exclusive use of lodgings and pays for them, he may well reside there. A person can have more than one usual residence. It's not necessary to be able to specify the places at which the debtor is said to have ordinarily resided. Ordinary residence does not, in the case I was involved in, what the debtor was doing was saying, even if I am resident in this jurisdiction, you can't say were. Now, that's a, that's a completely flawed argument because you don't need to be able to, to have to say that. All you have to say is, is we know that he resides in one or more places within the jurisdiction. Um, ordinary residence doesn't necessarily require the person residing to be the landlord or tenant on, under a lease or tenancy agreement. Ordinarily residing may include residing with family members, Care is needed as to the way to be attached to documentary evidence, such as parking permits and letterheads. But documentary evidence does have its part to play um, where there's an address given for official purposes, for example, a firearm certificate. Another useful document to bear in mind is if you look at a, a marriage certificate, um, you'll see on it that each of the parties to the marriage has to include a place of residence. <coughs> if one of the parties to the marriage has included a place of residence in this jurisdiction in the three years pre preceding a petition. That is going to be powerful evidence that that individual, in fact, resided for the purposes of the test within the three year period. Having access to a key kept of premises is not without significance. The purpose of a visit or visits may be relevant. It's important to distinguish between using the residence as such and carrying on corporate activity. 
and being capable of being telephoned at premises may be a relevant factor. So you can see it's a non-exhaustive list of matters. Let me, let me then just tell you about lacotamia. This is a, an interesting case where the question of whether the individual had had a place of residence the, the background facts are um, illuminating, but I won't tell you what the answer is, unless you already know, obviously, but I, I won't tell you. But against what I've just said, you can form your own view. Lacatamia obtains um, two judgments against Mr. Sue in the commercial court for very significant amounts in 2014 and 2015. It's not in dispute, and it wasn't in dispute in the case, that he is not domiciled in this jurisdiction. He's in fact a citizen of Japan and Taiwan. What happens is he petitions, he presents a bankruptcy application for his own bankruptcy on the 4th of July, 2020. And four days later, an insolvency adjudicator makes a bankruptcy order on his debtor's application. What I should also tell you is that Three months before he presents the bankruptcy application, he is released from HMP uh, Pentonville. And he's been in Pentonville for, for some time. But it's, it's as well, I just tell you, give you the, the factual background. In January 2018, I'm just reading it from the judgment so I don't misrepresent anything, for the, really for the benefit of Mr. Sue. January 2018, the the commercial court judge made an order requiring Mr. Sue to surrender his passports and remain in the jurisdiction of England and Wales to give disclosure of his assets and attend a hearing for that purpose. A few days later, he attempted to leave on a ferry to Belfast, but was arrested uh, and brought before the commercial court a few days after that. On the same day, he was served with a committal application for contempt. Between 16 January and 21 February, 2018, um, I'm sorry, 2019, he stayed at different hotels, several weeks at the Intercontinental Hotel in London, and from 21 February to 29 March 2019, he stayed in some service departments in Kensington and Chelsea, which he booked through, they could prove he booked through booking.com. 29 March, he's committed to Pentonville for 21 months for 10 counts of contempt which included his attempt to flee the jurisdiction after being served with the order of the commercial court judge. On the 11th of March, 2020, he's committed for a further four months for contempt of court and two applications to purge his contempt were dismissed. He's released from prison on the 9th of April, 2020, having served half of his sentence. And at that point, you'd think, well, isn't he gonna try and leave the jurisdiction? The problem is he couldn't because on the 30th of January, 2020, it's about two months before he was released, Mr. Justice Waxman made an order prohibiting leaving, him leaving the jurisdiction on his release from prison until he, was, until he had given evidence of his, uh, as, his, as to his assets at a hearing under CPR part 71. So what he then does is he stays, um, he sort of um, sofa surfs at a friend's in Surrey for a few weeks until the 20th of April. And then um, he lives in a flat in Maida Vale, which he referred to in his evidence as a squalid little flat, which was uh, rented to him. Um, surprised, well, not why should it be surprising me? It was rented, his landlord was his cellmate in Pentonville. So he, he lives there. He gets his bankruptcy order and he's delighted with it. Um, less delighted with it is the judgment creditor. Um, Lacatania and Lacatania apply for an annulment of the bankruptcy on the ground that he didn't have jurisdiction because the judge didn't have jurisdiction to make the order. And they, in fact, they apply for that and they, they at the same time make an application for summary judgment on the basis that he cannot be said to have had a place of residence in England in the three years preceding the petition. Um, that was dismissed. Surprising, I thought surprisingly, by the deputy ICC judge. And Lacatamia, like perhaps not surprisingly, then appealed. And the question before Mr. Justice Bacon was whether he had had a place of residence in the three years preceding the, um, the bankruptcy petition on the 4th of July, 2020. 
Well, I, I won't, as I said, it wasn't in dispute. He, he, wasn't, um, he wasn't domiciled in this jurisdiction. Um, the, the question um, all turned on, on that issue. And so, so as not to keep you out of the surprise, the, the judge reached the conclusion pretty, I'll say it's pretty one-sided, I think, the way he, it's not finely balanced, put it that way from the judgment, that, that um, he's going to set the bankruptcy order aside because he's not satisfied that Mr. Sue had a place of residence in the jurisdiction in the three preceding three years. Um, nothing in the summary remotely suggests that a debtor may have a place of residence where the debtor has not, in fact, ever resided, but which is the residence of a third party or which is owned by a third party, such as a prison, which the debtor is temporarily occupying with the permission of that third party. So the judge was unimpressed with the residence arguments and found that in fact he wasn't resident. And I think that that's a, a useful case for the purpose of determination of, of, of whether or not uh, the individual is, is resident or um, has a place of residence for the purpose of 2651B. Um, carried on business, I'll be brief on this. It's a question of fact. Um, the best case on it is Gate Gourmet at Luxembourg. That is useful because it refers to a, a case in which Mr. Justice Norris in 2015 called Masters, it's Neil Masters of um, um, the um, tax entrepreneur. Mercury tax, Neil Masters against Barclays Bank PLC. And the point that came out of that case is that you is you can have um, carrying on a business for bankruptcy petition purposes based on a single transaction. In that case, it was entering into a guarantee in this jurisdiction, which is often missed when that case is mentioned, included a clause that declared that the guarantor Masters was in fact resident in England at the time he signed the guarantee. Um, okay. Uh, I've mentioned, I'm sorry, I've mentioned um, Mellors already. Just want to mention, but not say anything at length about, just for completeness, that the court's got a common law jurisdiction to recognise foreign bankruptcy proceedings. I'm not a fluent Russian speaker. You might not think I'm a fluent English speaker, but the case of Nesh Prombank and Bedzimov is a 2021 decision of Mr. Justice Snowden, as he was, which is useful for its analysis of a large number of 19th century cases, looking at the common law's long-standing jurisdiction to recognise foreign insolvency proceedings. These were Russian insolvency proceedings brought against Mr. by the bank against Mr. B um, for a claim of £1.34 billion, um, which... It was alleged he had stolen uh, from the bank. The difficulty with it is, is that um, the common law jurisdiction doesn't benefit in any way from any statutory provision from which office holders or the courts can derive the powers in this jurisdiction. Most obviously, Section 426 of the Act, 1986 Act, or the Cross-Border Insolvency Regulations 2006. It's entirely common law based. The powers are very limited and particularly as regards a room, immovable property. What was of great interest to the bank in that case was a property at Belgrave Square in London, which the debtor owned, and which is worth about £29 million. And the, the applicant trustee, Russian trustee, wanted orders from the English court, vesting the property in him and making requiring the debtor who is within this jurisdiction to give information regarding his assets. And Mr. Justice Snowden said, well, when it comes to immovable property, there just isn't any jurisdiction for, for a court um, in this co country to, um, make, to grant that sort of relief, however um, regrettable that might be. Just to give you a feel for that case, um, there was a worldwide freezing order made against the debtor as well. And that had gone on appeal to the Court of Appeal. And I couldn't help noticing that the Court of Appeal had very much reduced down what the debtor was asking for his reasonable living expenses, which had included a monthly allowance of, for example, £2,000 for barber and toiletries, £2,500 golf club fees and similar expenses, pocket money of £4,000 for stepdaughter, 
£2,000 for daughter, as well as wages for chauffeurs, cooks, nannies, housemaids in London and Monaco, frequent travel costs for family. That's amongst a lot of other, including bodyguards clothing. Um, what, he, what he was granted was rent at £18,000 a week for his residential property in London, rent for a Monaco property, rent deposit of £144,000, private school fees, private security, and some people do have the need to watch their backs. Private security, £24,000 a month in London, £29,000 a month in Monaco, and £40,000 a month of living expenses. So it's a case that's off the scale in terms of the ordinary person in the street, but it's, it's worth bearing in mind that the court's got that common law jurisdiction in relation to foreign bankruptcies. Um, let me move on. This isn't anything to do with making bankruptcy orders, but I wanted to mention Hughes and Howell in the Court of Appeal. I'm mindful of the time. Um, this, has, uh, this chimes with something that um, Nick had talked about, Nick Taylor had talked about during his talk on, on winding up petitions this morning. In fact, I saw it was in his slides, Hughes and Howell, but he, he didn't say anything about it. That's not a criticism. Um, but it's, the reason it's, it, it's relevant is that um, this, Hughes and Howell gives confirmation of the court's approach to whether an offer which uh, the creditor has refused to accept, whether the offer to secure or compound the petition debt has been unreasonably refused. And I think from looking at it, the test is exactly the same. If, if it's not the same, it's almost exactly the same as the test that's applicable under the new petition regime, where the debtor makes an offer and then argues that the creditor is unreasonable in the circumstances in refusing it. And just, just so we understand it, because I know, I don't know if he's still on, on the um, call, but um, David Arundel had raised a question as to whether or not, I think the question came from David, as to is the test objective or subjective? Um, the, the, Hughes and Howell is useful because it confirms, it's Lord Justice Lewison who, who gives the legal judgment. It's a very strong court of appeal, but he, he'd done a number of cases on this area. But what he, he confirms is, is the, the following points, which I just make clear. The test is you look at whether it's unreasonably refused, the offer's unreasonably refused from the position of a reasonable hypothetical creditor. And therefore the test is objective. You look at all of the relevant factors on their, their impact on that objectively construed reasonable hypothetical creditor. Those factors may include the history of the case and in addition to that, there's an obligation on the debtor, which would be a factor to be taken into account by the court, that there's got to be full, frank and open disclosure so that the, the creditor who's making the decision can make a fully informed assessment of the offer. And importantly, the Court of Appeal fastened onto this. A creditor is entitled to have regard to his own interests and is not obliged to take a chance to show patience or generosity. And I'll just, I'll just explain there. I won't go into the details of it in any, at any length in Hughes and Howell. But that includes, that, and, and we'll have all seen cases like this. There was a petition debt. It's a, a, a modest in the scheme of things. It's a petition debt for £47,000. And there's a petition presented in May 2017. By March 2019, it's still trundling on. It's been adjourned. The debt is making offers. His aunt's died about a year after the petition is presented. He gives instructions to the executors to pay his share, which he says is a quarter. In fact, it turns out it's a fifth of the estate to the creditor. The sales held up, the property's not worth what they thought it was gonna be worth. He's actually only entitled to a fifth. And the debtor basically loses patience and says, uh, I'm sorry, the creditor loses patience. And the court is asked to dismiss it on the basis that the offer he's made is such that the debtor, that the creditor is unreasonably refusing what's on offer. And the court of appeal were pretty forthright in saying that he's not that the creditor's not being unreasonable at all in refusing an offer like that, which included in the interim, I'll give you ten thousand pounds towards the shortfall as it presently stands between what the property is worth and what I owe you. And so that was a case in which a bankruptcy order probably ought to have been made before the stage it reached. The only point I'd make is just as a footnote to that is it's very often missed that a debtor, if you're acting for debtors. There's a case called Edgington in 2015, which was um, Lord Justice Lewis and Miss Justice Lewis as well, which was which says that 
the court will want to be satisfied that if the debtor has made an offer, he can act- he or she can actually pay. It's not good enough to just say, I'll pay. You've got to be able to show how you're going to be able to pay. Um, and after that, it might be everybody who stayed on's lucky day because I may have run out of time to talk about the rule in ex parte James. I'll talk for about 30 seconds on it. The rule in ex parte James is not like the force in Star Wars. It's not an all answering solution to problems that can arise where one party is unhappy. I'd, if I had a pound for every piece of correspondence I've read that says, we would remind you of the rule in ex parte James. The rule in ex parte James is very, very limited in scope. And the case law over about the last 150 years shows it only really works in cases of unjust enrichment. A lot of people don't know what happened in ex parte James, and it, it's not especially complicated. All the case was really about was a judgment creditor called Bradshaw, who got a judgment against Mr. Condon, who's the debtor. And what he does is um, he pursues uh, the debtor um, and seizes his goods through a sheriff under a writ of uh, an FF writ. He then gets paid by the sheriff two days before a bankruptcy petition is presented. So he's got out, he's completed his execution. There's then a petition presented against Condon and he's made bankrupt. And the trustee in bankrupt, who was James, goes along to Bradshaw and says, I see you've got a, uh, you enforced your judgment. I want that money back. And he gave the impression that he was entitled to it. And what happens is that Bradshaw hands over the execution money, believing that he's liable to do so to the trustee. He then finds out that he's not liable. And you should, you should remember that in those days, in 1874, when the case was decided, uh, there was no um, action available to recover payment for a, to recover a payment made under a mistake of law. So he's he's not able. There isn't a mechanism, a legally identifiable cause of action by which he can recover that money. And it goes to its challenge. The refusal of the trustee is challenged, and it goes to it, it actually goes in front of the chief bankruptcy judge in those days, who was called Roach. And he said, no, the trustee can keep it. So it goes on then to a two-man court of appeal. And it's um, Lord Justice James, by coincidence, and Lord Justice Mellish in the court of appeal say, no, that's wrong. The trustee's got to give it back. It's basically a trick. And I think if you were to reduce the rule down, and this is my own formulation of it, but this is what I think comes out of the cases, it's this. If an officer of the court is under an obligation of conscience, and he almost always arises where the office holder is unjustly enriched, usually through a mistake, but not always, the court will direct the officer to fulfill that obligation. So if he's got money he shouldn't have, he's got to give it back, he or she. And you'll see, the reason I mention all of this is laymen, although strictly speaking, it's only March 2020, it's so important in explaining this and the test being fairness. You want to look at paragraph 65, and, and especially 68 in the judgment of Lord Justice David Richards. It, it, it gives you what you need to know about the rule and the court will act. That was a case where somebody had in, inadvertently signed a deed of settlement, which, which underplayed their debt by 1.26 million pounds. And the administrators stood to gain from that mistake. And they were told they couldn't because in conscience, what the court says is it's not fair. It's objectively unfair conduct. It's not, as Mr. Justice Hilliard had had at first instance, a question of looking at unconscionability. That isn't a test. That none of the, in fact, there's almost no support for that in the authorities. The question is one of unfairness. And Lord Justice David Richards kicks back quite sharply the suggestion the court isn't well placed to decide what's fair and what isn't fair. What he says is you can say to the court, is this fair or not? And there's one of two answers. So, and courts in the modern era are well used to dealing with the concept of fairness. I've, I've like everybody else, um, it's like playing it's a knockout. Remember, does anybody remember it's a knockout? I've had to whistle stop through that. And it doesn't bother me that I didn't get any sort of introduction at all. I'm only joking, that's fine with me. Um, I'm going to hand over now to um, Laura. If- I'll be talking about three cases in a little bit more detail. And as Louise says, we've tried to identify ones that aren't just decided on their facts and will actually provide some useful uh, information for people. And I can just see that Katie's going to share these slides now. So thank you very much for that, Katie. 
Um, it, they should provide some uh, useful guidance in future cases um, on areas that may well come up. And what I would say is that all three of the cases, um, whilst some of them are involving uh, some complex matters, are easily digestible. And I'd suggest that anybody that does uh have any of these issues that arise do you go and read the judgments and all three of them provide some very useful background to the uh areas uh, that are under consideration and an analysis of the case law i'm very conscious of the time and i'm very conscious of the time of day and i will say that some fairly detailed notes are going to be provided in relation to these three cases um, so i'm afraid i may be a, another whistle stop tour to finish off the discussions so starting with the first case of three this is manalitit partners plc against hayward and barrett holdings limited which is a 2021 case uh, bankruptcy update and as you can see my first bullet point is that this is actually a corporate case but it does uh, have application to insolvency proceedings uh, for personal insolvency matters um, it's a case that deals predominantly with the issue of bringing a part seven claim under an insolvency application and you can see the final bullet point discussing what's best practice. Well, that's really what I'm trying to focus on here. And there's some interesting commentary from uh, Chief Insolvency and Companies Court Judge Briggs um, in relation to the issues that actually arise here. Now, I say that we're trying to avoid cases decided on their own facts, but I did think it was relevant here that uh, two of the applications which aren't uh, given detailed uh, discussion in the judgment, one of them related to a strike house or summary judgment application uh, in relation to the question of de facto directorship, where the judge held that that was a question of fact, um, where evidence may be relevant, it was to be decided uh, as a trial. But moving on from that, the key application here was in relation to a Part 7 claim or a claim that ought to have been brought under Part 7, being brought under an insolvency application notice. Uh, the issue here really was raised by the respondents who were saying that this was a breach and there needed to be a fee paid uh, in order to uh, put the, part of the applicant in a position that it would have been if they brought a claim by Part 7. Now, not necessarily the end of the world once upon a time, but these days, obviously, it can be an awful lot more money for a party to consider when bringing past eight proceedings, depending on the value of the claim. Now, this is a case where Blackwater Plant Limited had entered a creditor's voluntary liquidation. Uh, there was a connected company known as Hayward and Barrett Limited, who also entered a CVL on the same day. Uh, Hayward and Barrett Limited were the main customer of Blackwater. And then the third and fourth respondents were the George uh, directors of Hayward and Barrett. And there were also allegations in relation to uh, de facto directorships. Now, the issue here uh, related to assignment of uh, the insolvency office holders uh, dealings here, essentially. Now, the case, again, it's a helpful starting point for setting out the insolvency process generally and what can be commenced out of court and within court. And it comments here that uh, most insolvency processes, the office holder will be looking at the interest of the creditor to get in and distribute assets of the debtor company, but that there are exceptions. And it talks about how here where there are schemes of arrangement with restructuring plans that don't require the appointment of an office holder, there can be a supervisor who controls and monitors the creditor's voluntary arrangement uh, where the creditors can agree and compromise their debts. Again, this is a case which is particularly helpful for looking into the uh, basic details in the background. And here the judge looks at uh, what he calls the transaction avoidance provisions. So section 213 fraudulent trading, going through to wrongful trading, Section 238, particularly importantly here, transactions at an undervalue, preferences, and then extortionate credit transactions. Now, here this case is looking in particular at Section 246ZD of the Insolvency Act and talks about how prior to this, it was thought that uh, office holders could assign rights of an action which vested in and formed part of the assets of the company such as misfeasance claims or breach of duty, at the time the company enters liquidation, um, an office holder could not assign property within the meaning of paragraph six of schedule four of the act if it arose at the commencement of the liquidation. 
And there's some helpful explanatory notes that are referred to here to uh, help set up the current position on the law. Uh, but what I thought was particularly helpful was a reference back to the decision of Snowden Jay, as he then was, in Cage Consultants Limited, where he talks about the policy behind the introduction of that section uh, under uh, Section 246ZD which was to permit claims arising on insolvency invested in liquidators or administrators to be sold or assigned, thereby providing a return to the insolvent estate to benefit society by increasing the likelihood that miscreant directors will be held to account and create a new market for such actions. And that provides a bit of the context within which this decision was being made, because it is a pragmatic decision. And indeed, as I say, the respondent's position that the uh, the issue fee for a part seven claim ought to be paid uh, seems to be somewhat pragmatic rather than merely uh, seeking a strikeout, for example. Now, there's t discussion here about how uh, the uh, in terms of the transaction avoidance provisions, there is a notable exception under section 423, which is actually very similar to section 238, which I referred to before transactions at an undervalue. But there's an additional element here that the transactions must have been entered into for the purpose of prejudic prejudicing the interests of the creditor. Now, that's relevant here because under the assignment provisions, um, which is what Section 246ZD uh, updates, shall I say, uh, given that uh, previous position, um, it looks at what uh, matters can be assigned in terms of those transaction avoidance provisions and what are the gateways for bringing those uh, applications or claims. So where we have a transaction as an undervalue, um, you would invoke Section 212, whereas where we're looking at um, the uh, additional element under Section 243, uh, then one would look to Section, uh, sorry, 423, getting late in the day, then we'd look at Section 424 to see who is able to uh, avail themselves uh, of that uh, application. That The detail is set out here, um, but ultimately the issue in this case, as I say, goes to assignment. And again, apologies, conscious of the time, I'll jump to that a little bit here. Ultimately, it wasn't disputed between the parties that the matter that uh, the uh, assignee of the Blackwater claims, which were claims against the directors, um, were not claims that were being brought under Section 212 and Section 238, but were instead matters being brought under Section 423 and 424. And the reason for that is that they were claims that vested in the company being brought against the directors. And there's a distinction drawn here between what an office holder can do and the applications that an office holder can bring. Now, Again, the uh, judgment goes into the background of what can be brought under form IAA and Rule 135 of the Insolvency Rules uh, 2016. Um, so again, does provide clear guidance when approaching these sorts of matters. Um, and it was said that there was no issue here concerning the claims that can be brought under an insolvency application, as opposed that needed to be brought, those that needed to be brought under uh, Part 7. Now here the Blackwater claims against the directors were in relation to irrecoverable debts um, and uh, property, large plant valued significant sums of money in total uh, over a million pounds and cars that had said had been surrendered between one company and another for which the third and fourth respondents were said both to be directors. Now, here, because the company would be the claimant, in terms of what is assigned, that's an action of the company and it will involve a question of fact. And so the appropriate originating process is under part seven. Now, essentially, this is a strict matter of statutory construction that that type of claim could not be brought um, under a uh, insolvency application. But that's what has happened here. The uh, discussion essentially comes from the applicant saying, well, that's what people do. That's the ordinary practice. Uh, that's what everyone's been following. And one can see why that makes sense. Indeed, here the judge has referred at paragraph 37 uh, to Mr. Curl, Queen's Counsel, who's making those submissions, uh, making forceful responses. 
And he touched upon a case there of Taunton Logs, which was a decision of his honour Judge Corson, Queen's Council, where a similar matter had arisen. And there Judge Corson found that actually um, it was just an issue fee that needed to be paid uh, to put them in the position they would have been if they'd issued under Part 7, and that it was possible to remedy that defect under CPR Rule 310. Now, in terms of uh, this being standard practice, the submissions were made, and these are relevant for the judge's uh, decision making, that all claims touch, touching or concerning an insolvency are capable or should be capable of being brought in one court, one list, before the same judge, and CPR 7.3 expressly supports this proposition. There is a business and property courts list which is intended to provide user autonomy. Um, and any procedure that prevents that, forcing a claimant to choose a list which does not have a specialist judge when such expertise required is inconsistent with that aim. At CPR Part 49 governs uh, the procedure under the Companies Act 2006 and relates to uh, companies and limited liability partnerships and details the requirement for Part 8 claim forms there. Part 7 claims can only be brought for limited proceedings and it just happened that this was a case that fell into one of those matters. Now, there are a number of other uh, issues that are raised, but ultimately the summary is it's illogical to have claims that clearly need to be heard together on the same or similar facts that shouldn't be having decisions made by different and here non-specialist judges, because that's a waste of time and court resources. And ultimately what the judge ends up concluding is, well, it, it may be that this has been common practice, but just because it's common practice doesn't mean that it should continue if it doesn't fit within the uh, legislative uh, framework. Um, he talks about hybrid claims and it's worth reading paragraph 41 in full um, where the judge identifies the principles that can be drawn out from all of the cases uh, that have been referred to and it identifies points such as um, the uh, specialist jurisdiction to be able to deal with these sorts of insolvency matters and how this is a matter arising in insolvency. It identifies that where claims uh, should proceed by way of Part 7 claim form, but is included in insolvency application, the court does have discretion to permit the claim to continue where the claim is made as a consequence of the liquidation. Um, the reason for doing that, and I think this is a particularly important phrase to remember, is because it is procedurally convenient or sensible or economical. And in circumstances like this, one struggles to imagine why it wouldn't be so. But the uh, one of the principles also identified is that uh, thought needs to be given to uh, whether there's been any bad faith or abuse of process uh, in this matter um, and that a different decision may be made in those circumstances. Um, and that was a matter that was also identified in Taunton Logs as concerns about abuse of process. Now, uh, in the circumstances, the court may impose conditions to permit a claim that should have started under Part 7 to proceed by way of an insolvency application. And in this case, it was found that the appropriate condition here ought to be the same, as was in Taunton Logs, which is to pay the difference between the fee pay paid to issue the insolvency application and that which would have been paid for that claim under Part 7. Now, practically speaking, it's uh, difficult to see why that condition ever shouldn't have been imposed in these circumstances where that is a separate claim um, and why you might want to go about issuing a Part 7 claim form in the first instance and then go through the difficulties of having those two separate claims and trying to deal with the matters in that way. Now, that is a very practical decision, pragmatic decision, and it's a very pragmatic approach that was taken by the respondents here and it, it doesn't really go into too much of the arguments that were probably the genuine ones as to why this would want to be avoided if it were the cost of the uh, issue fee but I, as I say it's worth noting the judge's comments at paragraph 60 where he says I've reached these conclusions with regret the criticisms of the procedure are well made by Mr Curl they do not promote a convenient or sensible or economical use of court resource in modern parlance the result fails to ensure that the claims of this nature are dealt with expeditiously allotting an appropriate share of the court's resources 
an office holder and assignee of claims will be forced to issue claims arising from an insolvency using different procedures in different lists within the prisons and property courts, with the risk that without transfer, they will be case managed, at least by different judges, although the claims arise out of the same facts. So it is a practical decision, but it's a difficult one where the judge identifies the previous approaches uh, that it said have become common, but says that ultimately it becomes a matter uh, for relief from sanction under CPR 3.10 um, if uh, this is something that has happened and it may be that approaches might want to be taken to getting a similar sort of agreement uh, or stances taken by the respondents here to say, well, um, these clearly need to be heard together. It's going to cost extra time, take extra money for us to issue two separate sets of proceedings. There isn't any abuse of uh, process. So can it be agreed that you won't take issue if we do this, um, albeit an issue fee needs to be paid? Or I suppose some people might take that approach um, and see what uh, point is taken about the issue fee. Uh, but worth noting in respect of both personal and corporate insolvency proceedings. As I say, I will uh, race through these a little bit now, uh, but there will be detailed notes. The next case is Wilson and Sinclair. Uh, this is in relation to a third party debt order. And it's a little bit cringeworthy reading, uh, just putting uh, oneself in the shoes of the advocate in this case. Um, this was a court of appeal case uh, uh, from 2021, uh, which identifies the uh, risk of bringing insolvency proceedings, proceedings for tactical purposes. Um, there was a huge background of litigation and issues between these two parties, um, claims being brought, significant costs being incurred, amounts not being paid, arbitral proceedings to be gone through. Um, and in the process of all of this, it seems that uh, a third party debt order was sought as a way to try and reduce some of the money owed by one party to another. Um, now, at the same time as that was going on, it actually appears uh, that the appellant here had issued bankruptcy proceedings um, in 2018 for a bankruptcy that actually took place in 2021. In the meantime, there'd been a third party death order made on an interim basis on the papers in the first instance, but then refused to be uh, converted into a final third party death order uh, for a number of reasons set out in the decision, um, but ultimately which seemed potentially could have been wrong. And I say that on the basis of the Court of Appeals comments that there was a uh, re realistic prospect of the appeal succeeding. The appeal initially went to His Honour Judge Pelling, Queen's Counsel, um, but both uh, the first instance and the appeal judge, noting the potential for arguments, uh, continued the interim debt order whilst the uh, appeals were going through and being heard. And I say it's a bit cringeworthy because at paragraph three, the decision reads, shortly before the hearing of the appeal, Mr. Sinclair was made bankrupt on a petition by MWP itself. In those circumstances, we asked Mr. Brian, Dr. Queen's counsel, who appeared for MWP, to explain how MWP could pursue its appeal, given the terms of section 2853A and section 3461 of the Insolvency Act 1986. And one would hate to have been in his shoes at that point when the Court of Appeal asked that question. And ultimately what the Court of Appeal decide is that those are very clear cut provisions that mean that where the uh, interim debt order is only at an interim stage, um, that isn't uh, a matter that uh, has finally crystallised and gives the applicant protection uh, once the bankruptcy has been entered. And I'll jump to you through to some of the particularly interesting conclusions on this. Um, one, it looks at, um, well, would there be a reasonable prospect of obtaining an under, order under Section 3466 of the Insolvency Act, which would be uh, required as a step in order to uh, reopen these matters, essentially? And what the court says is, well, that's not the basis of bankruptcy. If you don't have, uh, if you're a creditor, then one creditor shouldn't be able to obtain priority over another by completing an attachment, i.e. finalising the third party debt order, um, once the bankruptcy order has been made. And that would be a, a, a significant inroad into the principles that underpin uh, bankruptcy. And so it would be something exceptional that was required in the circumstances. 
here it was held that there wasn't anything so uh, exceptional. And um, based in terms of making this decision on the decision on whether to hear the appeal on costs, uh, the, uh, the appellant was particularly criticised on the basis that, well, you're the one that started the bankruptcy. So it shouldn't have been a surprise to you. You could have applied for a stay whilst you were still waiting for the uh, hearing of the th uh, third party debt order to be made final, which it seems was adjourned on a number of occasions. And you didn't do that. And so when uh, it was uh, the application was made for the appeals to be heard in any event to determine the costs at the earlier stage, it was considered, well, compared to the uh, over a million pounds that's in dispute on both sides between the parties, uh, a few tens of thousands of costs really isn't that significant in the great scheme of things. Yes, there are some points that could be of general application, but once you drill down into them, they're more likely to be on a factual basis. But as paragraph 62 says, Third, and to my mind decisively, the current situation is one of MWP's own making, as I've already explained. That's in relation to them both issuing the bankruptcy application and not applying for a stay of that whilst the third party death order was outstanding. So, and it says that they chose to present that application um, and that given the general principles, the court would be cautious in permitting an appeal to be continued solely for the sake of costs. And so this seems to point firmly to not exercising the discretion in MWP's favour. And so it's worth looking at this decision where you have got an awful lot of back and to and various different te technical ways that are being taken to try and reduce the liabilities between the parties. If you've got outstanding matters and you've got an outstanding bankruptcy, you need to be pretty clear in terms of the timeline where that's getting you to. Um, and why, uh, what's going to be determined first and what the impact could be, because uh, the appellant here really lost out because of that. This is a decision in Breaking Others Against Lowe's and Others. Um, this is a very complex um, and uh, really rather testy factual background between the parties. Um, and bearing time in mind, I won't go into the detail of that, but safe to say uh, the issues over property uh, the uh, breaks had been made bankrupt. They were trustees of a family trust of which they didn't have any beneficial interest in. Um, and they were also, uh, there had been a liquidation which they were also part of. And so this matter deals with uh, essentially not quite concurrent uh, statutory provisions, but almost touching upon uh, both bankruptcy um, applications under Section 1031 of the Insolvency Act 1986 and uh, very similar provisions relating to liquidation under Section 1685 of the Insolvency Act. And that's to do with um, who can make a uh, challenge, whether they are aggrieved uh, for challenging the conduct of the liquidator um, and similar language that's used in respect to the bankruptcy. Now, trying to cut through things as quickly as possible uh, at this time of day, um, there were a number of different uh, positions in which the breaks stood and a number of different bases upon which they had uh, uh, essentially been struck out for not having standing. And so, again, I say it's worth looking at, well, my notes when they come out and the uh, full judgment if you have issues of standing in terms of challenging the conduct of the trustee in bankruptcy and the liquidator of a formal partnership. There were some very serious allegations here uh, made against the trustee in bankruptcy, essentially of collusion um, with the other party in relation to the sale of land from which all of these disputes had originally arisen um, and property that was said to be the Brakes' uh, primary residence and family home. We see an Article 8 point that rises and is immediately dismissed, um, so you won't really get any guidance from that here. Um, but in terms of uh, what is decided on this point, um, there's, again, a very detailed uh, analysis of the case law that leads up to this matter. Um, the Dodwell and Deloitte cases are both uh, identified here. Uh, and that's uh, Deloitte and Touche against the attorney uh, there against A.G. Johnson and Imri Odessa, the debtor against Dodwell. Um, some quite long standing cases. Again, I'll touch upon those in my notes for consideration in a bit more time. Now, the original decision that was made here was that the Brakeses did not have standing for challenging the conduct of the trustee in bankruptcy or the liquidator in relation to the sale of the property to another party in which it was said that the uh, trustee in bankruptcy and liquidator was involved. 
Now, the basis on which that was said was because as the trustees in settlement, they weren't invited as the trustees in settlement to submit their own offers to buy the property or the land. And that applied under both the bankruptcy uh, and the liquidation. And then um, different matters were taken in terms of being former bankrupts and the limits on which um, situations can arise where one can challenge the conduct of the trustee in bankruptcy because it was identified, well, there has to be limits because otherwise every bankrupt would want to challenge every trustee in bankruptcy on every decision if there aren't those limits for the extra um, steps that are needed. And then in terms of the unsecured creditors, it was a question of whether they were actually uh, genuine concerns that were being raised. So in terms of the trustees of the settlement, that was dismissed quite quickly. They weren't invited as such uh, as trustees of the settlement to engage in the um, submitting of bids to purchase property. And so they stood wholly outside the matters of the bankruptcy and the liquidation when the individuals, the breakers, made applications uh, as, as individuals to submit offers um, to purchase, pro purchase property. So it's more interesting in relation to the situation as former bankrupts. Um, there it was uh, said to be impliedly accepted um, by the council that, um, yes, they were um, persons who were dissatisfied for the purposes of Section 301 of the Insolvency Act to make a challenge, but that it was impliedly accepted that there needed to be a further step um, for them to take issue with the bidding process. Now, in the first instance decision, the judge had said that that additional step would be where there was a surplus that could be realised from the uh, bankruptcy related to this transaction and that that was never going to happen here. Um, but that was the one point where the appeal was allowed here, where the judge said, well, actually, no, that's that's not enough. Uh, or that's not in and of itself the only basis on which it can uh, go ahead. There can be other reasons why um, the uh, the bankrupt is someone who is dissatisfied for the purposes of the section of 3031 of the Insolvency Act. And here, because the allegations were quite so serious against the involvement of the trustee in bankruptcy, um, it was said that those allegations of bad faith meant that there was actually standing for them to challenge uh, the uh, steps taken by the trustee in bankruptcy here. The unsecured creditors one is also an interesting point. There was obviously separate re representation for the unsecured creditors, but there was uncontested evidence that um, actually it was the breakers who were funding and giving the instructions for what steps the uh, unsecured creditors or what position the unsecured creditors ought to take. And they said, well, that doesn't matter. That's not related to standing. And even if that is an issue, that's an issue that should remain uh, for the uh, uh, for the final trial. And here it was said uh, by Lady Justice Asplin, no, that's not right. Actually, the first instance judge was right to get a grip of the issue, to grasp the nestle as it was described. And here that is a relevant consideration to uh, whether someone has standing um, uh, in relation to challenging the liquidator of a former partnership, because essentially they're just going behind uh, standing behind the unsecured creditors when actually it only matters to the breaks. It doesn't actually matter to the unsecured creditors. And therefore, that wasn't a way to get around this challenge. Um, so where you do have these sorts of circumstances uh, of people standing in these shoes and you're looking to make these types of challenges um, in relation to the way in which the trustee in bankruptcy and uh, or the liquidator of a former partnership has acted, it's worth having a look at this decision to look at the steps, look at the concerns that might arise. Um, and it's also probably worth noting uh, where there was the trustees as a settlement, but the individuals were invited um, to uh, make an offer for the property that was uh, in dispute, um, what the issue is there in terms of how that offer is then made, if you try to make it as a trustee of the settlement uh, to try and keep matters within the bankruptcy and therefore potentially keep alive uh, the sort of dispute that we saw here. Uh, now, sorry that was such a whistle stop tour um, on some fairly complex matters, but as I say, um, my notes will be coming out on that, and at least I hope that we've identified some useful cases for you to consider and get some guidance from if these issues arise.